I'm Roger. And I'm Claudia. In the mid-1980s, a group of researchers went to a beach in Southern California, stayed there for 31 days and kept track of windsurfers. They measured who would interact with whom, how people moved between one subgroup of windsurfers and the other group of windsurfers, uh, friendships, uh, animosity, etc. Um, after collecting that data, they analyzed it as a social network. Uh, that way they could get a really good insight in how relationships, social relationships evolve over time and the structure of society, etc. This is what we'll be doing in our course, Social Network Analysis for Data Scientists. Uh, well, with the exception of spending a month on the beach, obviously. Um, our focus will be on how we analyze real-world social network data uh, using the latest statistical models. Our focus will not be on algorithms. Our focus will mainly be on statistical analysis of social network data. Do you see this network behind me? This is a visualization of Spotify data, musicians collaborating with each other. Do you understand what is going on in this visualization behind me? I don't think so. In this class, we can teach you how to do a proper network visualization, but this is not enough anyway. That's why we're also going to teach you how to use the scripted statistics for networks to understand what's happening there. But not only this, we are also going to teach you how to use network models to explain why these musicians are behaving the way they are. And uh, if you are not interested in people, this is not a big deal because when you learn network theory, you can apply it to any kind of relationship, any kind of data. And that's why this is a good opportunity to be creative and to explore what you actually want to explore. Over the course of the semester, you will be working with your group on an actual empirical analysis of network data that you gathered yourself that you will apply the methods and techniques to that you will learn in this course. You will also get an exam at the end of the semester that is a combination of open questions about the theories, the models, techniques, the concepts, etc. of social network analysis and about half of that exam consists of an analysis where you will get some data from us, you get some research questions from us and then you actually have to figure out how to analyze that using the methods and techniques from this course um, and you know, program that during the exam in R and provide the answers to us. During the class, we will try to be as nerdy fun as possible. We like jokes and we don't like boring stuff as much as you don't. So, for instance, you will get to experience our game, our network game on campus, where you will uh, role play to understand how the role and the position that you have in a network affect all the dynamics that happen in the network. And you will be part of our network hackathon in a few weeks. And also you will be uh, taught with a, a new R package that Roger and I are writing, which is innovative and we hope much more fun than the usual uh, learning that you are uh, that you experienced before. So looking forward to see you in class. Now, if, if, if you just you know, turn on the TV um, or you open it or open a newspaper, you, 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 you must realize that the world that we live in is extremely complicated. Um, and if you just look around, you, look around yourself, there's, it's, it's, it's in, in a way a hopelessly complicated world, right? So we have a society where we have billions of individuals that are all interacting with each other or, you know, or fighting with each other or, uh, you know, or, or trading with each other. So there's, there's, it's an enormous amount of autonomous, autonomous people that all have their own minds and have their own interests and have their own, uh, you know, own expertise and, and their own ideas uh, and their own needs um, and their own norms. Um, that may or may not, you know, fit with other people. So we have a couple billion people uh, just making up society uh, actively. Um, 
other systems around, around that, that 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 you you know that you see are of course you know are the, the whole communication infrastructure where we send each other email like you know the SNA 40s at jads.nl you know we send we send each other email we have our cell phones we send each other app messages there's a, there's a lot of interaction going on um, and um, if you look at the structure of whole of the whole communication in in the world it's it, it's unbelievably complex, unbelievably uh, complicated. Um, just the understanding of how how an individual brain works, you need to figure out how all the, the, the neurons you know wire and fire together and how how, how they connect. Um, I was uh, I was involved in, in in a study where we looked at cancer cells and we looked at how, you know how how the, how the different components connect to each other. How if you if you can look at different structures that uh, that you know network structures essentially uh, inside your body that can 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 tell us whether someone has you know uh, is is likely to 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 uh, to develop some kind of cancer later on. Um, those are structures that are extremely complicated to understand, which is why we still have cancer in the world, even though it's you know it, it's it's been going on for a long time, and you would expect that we would have some kind of cure for that, but we are still pretty far from, from, from that. Um, if you look at our metabolic system where we have all, you know, all, all, within our cells, just within the single cell, you see what, all the interactions that are needed just you know, to get our metabolic system uh, working and to, to generate our, our, our energy. Um, it's unbelievably complex, just it's single cell. And then if you, if you, you know, imagine all the billions of cells that we have in our body, that's, you know, we are made up of extremely complex uh, structures. Um, but even if you if you if you take it uh, you know less esoteric in, in a way, uh, I do a lot of uh, a, a lot of analysis in sports, where we do network analysis uh, in professional sports. For example, where we analyze soccer mas matches, and even then you have 22, 22 at any point in time you have twenty two players plus you know the referee and and, and the assistant referees. Uh, and they're, they're constantly moving and interacting on the pitch uh, 90 minutes plus and interacting in all kinds of complicated ways. And as a result, you know, you win one nil or you lose one nil. So what is the, so it's an extremely complicated structure that in the end leads to what do we need to do in order to win this match? Uh, we, you know, we lost it last year. How, how, what do we do this year in order to win it? Um, so that, that, that even just that, even just a, a thing like, a simple soccer match is actually a very complicated system uh, if you look at it. Now, the fact that we are surrounded by those uh, those those kinds of systems um, is actually something that uh, drives uh, the whole field, or at least partly the field of social network analysis. So here, what you see is just uh, since you know. It, Every day when we turn on a television these days, we, we, we see all the violence that's going on right now in Afghanistan. Now, this is a, uh, a, a drawing that was made of the um, American uh, counterinsurgency operation. Uh, in this, so this, this, this particular picture was made in 2009, and this was made in order to understand who interacts with whom on the ground in Afghanistan, um, you know, in, in, in in this particular interaction of just this part of whatever was going on in Afghanistan at, at, at that time, just the counterinsurgency activity of the Americans. So there you can see that even there, it's just incredibly complicated. And actually, uh, uh, a general who saw this, this, uh, this picture at the time, uh, he, he made the comment that, well, you know, by the time that we actually understand this picture, we will have won the war. Uh, it's, it's that complicated. They also didn't understand it themselves. Um, and this is just one aspect of the world that we live in, right? So, um, th so these kinds of systems are collectively called complex systems. And um, I'm sure that some of you have, have some background in complex systems uh, before you came to JADS. Uh, so you'll, you'll, you'll recognize the ideas. Um, and you can see in the examples that I just gave that complex systems are you know, play a role in, in, in our daily life, right? It's not just some, some kind of abstract notion. It's something that, uh, you know, plays a role every day uh, in your life, whatever you do, when you go to the grocery store, when you, um, you know, when, when, you, when you take a course, uh, when you play soccer or whatever. And, it's, and um, 
it's something that 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 has an enormous impact on our life. And the idea is that understanding complex systems and, and being able to not just understand them but also predict them and, and, and figure out how they what they look like and why they are the way they are and how we can change them so how we can control them um, that is generally seen as one of the main intellectual challenges for the for the 21st century um, and I very vividly recall a meeting um, three or four years ago when jazz was actually still at the other wing of the of the building that it's now, where now all the all the companies are. That's actually where Jazz was originally, uh, and we had this long meeting with all the professors. Uh, and, and again, everybody agreed that you know this is the main challenge that we need to discuss, that we need to tackle in society and in data science in general. Um, so, if you look at these complex systems, you you will easily see that they are actually networks. So if you look at, at, at your, the, the metabolic uh, example that I just gave, you, know, you, you, you have tiny molecules and they are connected by chemical reactions and that gives a network, right? We have a network of, of the nodes being molecules and you have relationships between the nodes, those are chemical reactions. Um, if you look at the web, for example, where you have all the, all the different files on the web that are connected by links and that you know, point to each other uh, back and forth. Um, and um, the web itself is an incredibly big and complex network. Uh, and that can be studied as such. And we will study some of that uh, as a network. And I'll show you a little bit of how to do that uh, in, in, a, uh, in a future lecture. Um, and then, of course, we have you know, social networks. Uh, and then when we talk about social networks in this course, we don't, we don't uh, necessarily refer to, to Twitter or Instagram or, um, or Facebook. Or but we really look at, we, we, we really talk about humans, you know, like you and I and our interactions. And, 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 and so we have in, in a social network, we have you know, persons, individuals in, in, in that network. And we have all kinds of relationships. We have friendship relationships. We have professional relationships. We have trust relationships, advice relationships, co-worker relationships, or co-taking a course relationships, and all, all kinds of relationships that we have within that one network. And as you can immediately see, that can become pretty complex pretty quickly. Um, now, the interesting thing is that if, if you look at, 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 at these different kinds of networks, um, they are generated by very different things. Like, so the metabolic network that we talked about, that, you know, there's the full evolution of mankind uh, that created that particular structure. So it's not like a, a totally random structure where your metabolic network is very different from my metabolic network. No, actually, these networks are pretty similar. Um, now, but you know, it's pretty different from what our, our, our metabolic networks were, you know, two billion years ago. So that actually that so that was created by you know, evolution. Whereas if you look at the World Wide Web, that's actually created by how we as individuals interact with each other. And when you put up a new page on the internet and you link to other pages, you're actively changing the World Wide Web yourself. Um, if you look at that, so that's that's very new. That's very recent. That is you know, on every day we can change that that, that uh, we can change that that uh, that structure. Um, if you look at social networks, in, in the, uh, then you can say, well, there's actually the way that we started to as 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 a, as, a, as a society that we started to interact with each other and develop norms and trusts and you know that it's that it that it makes sense that when i ask you a question that you respond to me or vice versa right those are those are norms that you know we have developed over the, over the years um and that are now driving our interactions so now when you ask me a question in class you actually expect me to answer right it's not that this that's a norm that you're making up on the spot but it's actually something that is rooted in our society as well and that took hundreds or if not if not thousands of years to develop um, so we, you, you see there's, there's just these three different networks have a very different history, like you know, billions of years ago, thousands of years ago, or just, you know, a decade, the World Wide Web. Uh, well, actually, the, the web started earlier, but you know, most of what the, the web is right now is due to how we interacted with, uh, with each other over the last decade. And every day we're still actively changing it and growing it 
uh, at an incredible speed. So you would expect that those networks actually would be very different from one each other, for, 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 from each other, and, and would also, um, you know, so they, 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 they would they would be governed by very different different systems. And one of the interesting things that that uh, have been found uh, over the last twenty ish years is that if you look at these, these different networks, even though they emerge from very different processes, like biological processes or social processes or, or technological processes, that in the end, they actually seem to be governed by very similar organizing principles. And because that is the case, we can actually use a common set of tools to explore these systems. So even though we will be focusing on social networks in this course mainly, a lot of these tools that we're going to be discussing um, are also applied in biology and are, are applied in medicine, are applied uh, in uh, computer science or et cetera. So that's one of the cool things about this course is that we're going to be teaching you a, a set of mathematical and statistical tools um, and, uh, and, and a bunch of, 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 of structures to look at we're going to be telling you what kinds of structures you might want to look at first and then how to you know what to add on top of that what to add on top of that when you analyze a, a, an actual so an actual network um, and all that knowledge can be applied after this course not just to social networks but also to all kinds of other networks so if you want if you want to study like like the network that i referred to a while ago on uh, where, where we looked at cancer those networks actually build on very similar statistics and very similar structures that we're going to be discussing uh, when we talk about communication networks, for example, or, or uh, friendship networks or whatever. Um, and you, you, you'll use the very same uh, statistical techniques to analyze those. So um, we will focus on social networks because that, you know, one choice actually makes it makes the course much more focused and coherent. At the same time, it is good to realize that you can actually use that uh, in so many different uh, different fields when you have networked data. And, and I think by now you should realize that network data are actually around us wherever you look. Um, Okay, so when we talk about network science, um, there's a couple of characteristics uh, of, of that field. And one is that it's interdisciplinary. Um, so we will be using examples from different kinds of fields and also the models that we are, that we are going to discuss with you uh, have their basis in lots of different kinds of fields. So although we will be you know, giving you a lot of examples from sociology, economics, organization studies, political science, uh, statistics, um, the, a, a lot of what we do is actually also informed by computer science, but also on the other hand, like anthropology, very qualitative kind, kind of field. Uh, and that, that they all, uh, all contributed to the development of the network science uh, field as a whole. So, um, which is another reason why, you know, or, or, or another sign of that what we're doing is actually fits with a very broad set of, of, of networks. Um, next to it uh, being uh, interdisciplinary, it's also very much empirical. So th there are essentially at least two fields that look very similar. So you have network science and you have the field of graph theory. Graph theory is, is the uh, purely theoretical, mathematically, but ma mathematically theoretical view of what networks look like and what they could look like. And, you know, the graph theorists will look at all kinds of, of, of network structures and then they will call a network, they will call it a graph, but it's essentially the same thing. And then they will study all kinds of structures that are there and then look at, well, you know, if the structure is slightly different, what, you know, what kind of properties does it have? So this is a pretty... This is very, very, that's a very much mathematical approach, uh, but it's at the same time, it's also very theoretical. Whereas what we are doing is we, we look at, you know, actual real life data, and then we look at, okay, so how can we analyze that? How can we understand that using empirical tools and techniques? Um, and that is core to, uh, to uh, network science, whether you come at it from a social point of view or more physics point of view, 
that is uh, you know, one of the traits of network science. Um, and the main interest in network science is quantitative. So even though a lot of network analysis is also being done um, uh, using qualitative methods, and that is really cool, really good, really excellent research that is that is qualitative. Uh, that's not what we are interested in in this field, uh, in this course, and certainly it is also not what we are interested in in the field of network science per se. Um, so we are going to be taking very much a quantitative look, and quantitative than me, a little bit mathematics, but mainly statistics uh, of. Uh, what, what networks look like and how they develop and, and what can explain their development and what you know, the outcomes are of their structure, etc. Um, now, one of the of the consequences of that is that, so Bram, you want to ask a question now? Um, yes, about, go ahead. Previous, about previous slide. Could you give yeah. one example of a quantitative and an example of a qualitative? Um, uh, analysis yeah so uh, sure yeah yeah so so quantitative is essentially so if, if we so one of the things that we're going to going to look at a little later in this course is uh okay so let, let me give you a research question and then two different approaches more quantitative more qualitative um so i have done a lot of research in the field of social influence where i'm interested in how people influence each other um, in terms of their behavior, in terms of their norms, in terms of their preferences, etc. Um, so if you take a quantitative approach to that, and that's what we're going to be doing in this course, uh, we, are we are going to collect uh, network data, and then we have statistical models to, uh, to say, well, you know, there are different reasons why you may have, let's say, a political preference. Um, just you know, just make the example pretty simple for now. Just let's say political preference, and I want to I want to model uh, you on a uh, or you know I want to model all of us on a on on a on a, uh, a continuum from you know very left wing to very right wing. And of course, anyone who has a background in political science knows that it's actually not a continuum, but it's actually uh, a, 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 a circle. But Let's just let's assume now that there's you know, go from very left to very right, and I want to understand how you know we influence each other in terms of our political position, just as a simple example. Now, a quantitative approach would be something that, that we're going to be discussing later later in, on in the course. That's called a network autocorrelation model, where we we look at okay, so everybody's uh, everybody's statistical or uh, uh, political position is probably a function of a bunch of personality. Or, or personal traits like, you know, what do you have a job? How old are you? Are you a man or a woman? Are you, you know, uh, how, how much money do you have? Uh, you know, what did your parents vote for, uh, etc. Right? So there's a, maybe where do you live? Uh, uh, your socioeconomic status, whatever. But there's a whole bunch of things that you know may differentiate you from all the other people, and as a result, you may lean more to the left or to the right. Um, in addition, you also interact with other people. And if you interact with a lot of people who all, all tell you that you know, the, 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 the left-wing parties are, are wonderful and the right-wing parties are terrible, or the other way around, you are, you know, you, 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 in the end, you, you, you get influenced by them. Um, so these statistical models actually test to what extent you are influenced and what's kind of, you know, by whom are you influenced? Uh, and how strong is that? And is it statistically significant? Um, and if we control for other things, that, right? So you're actually building like a regression model, if you will, uh, but it's a little bit more complicated, but it's, you can think of it that way, where we try to understand uh, what's, what's, what's going on and, 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 and you know, how, how strong is that effect and when does that effect occur, et cetera. But from a statistical point of view, um, a more qualitative approach would be uh, research where you go to people and you say, you know what, um, let me interview you. Let, let me. Who do you listen to? You know what? What? Uh, how did your 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 view of the world, your political view of the world, how did it develop? And uh, tell me about your youth, and tell me about your friendships, and tell me about uh, you know what. And, and then you yeah, you interview ten people or maybe fifty people, whatever. And based on that, you come to some kind of of, of an idea of what probably happened. You 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 build that story. Um, 
or you you work at it from a more anthropological point of view is where you you just watch people and you just sit back and you watch and you try to interpret in your head what's going on and then you build that story um that is, that, is, that is a qualitative social network analysis because they use qualitative. So if I look at it, it looks like people who are very central, they seem to have more influence. And then I, I, I observe that there are some people who are more on the periphery that you know, don't seem to interact as much. And um, when I hear them speak, they don't seem to be influenced as much. Right? So that is a qualitative point of view. And that is also useful. I mean, and there, there's, I mean, there's that, that can give a lot of insight. Um, but in a network science perspective, we are mainly interested in quantifying and say, well, you know, how strong is that, inf is that influence? Well, the influence is, you know, 5.6, the coefficient is 5.6, or the coefficient, is, or, you know, or uh, an order, the order correlation parameter is 0 0.9, which is extremely high. Uh, or, you know, and, we can, and you know, this is, this is significant, and we can control for these variables. And then, right, so that's, it would be the same question, but from a very different point of view. Does that help or is that still? No, no, it does definitely. Thanks, uh, thanks for the example, Roger. Sure. Thanks for asking. So really appreciate that. Um, so one of the things that you'll find very quickly is that our field uh, while being exciting is also quite challenging in terms of uh, the computational challenges because analyzing networks um, just just you know if, if you just have 10 people in a network uh, and you, you 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 discard relationships that people may have with themselves so if you just have 10 people in a network there are already 90 possible relationships right if you just allow for a single relationship between people uh, there are 90 possible, directed relationships so if i if i distinguish a, a relationship from me to you from a relationship for you to me for example if it's uh, you know advice giving you know i may give you advice but you may not give me advice so that's that's called a directed relationship then there are in, in a network of 10 people there are already 90 uh, uh relationships so if you have uh, 100 people then you already have uh 9900 uh, uh so almost 10,000 relationships so that it blows up quadratic, quadratically with the size of the network. And then we're only still assuming that the relationship there are either there or not. So, you know, it's on or off. Uh, whereas in reality, it matters whether I give you advice once or every day or, you know, every minute or only once a week or once a month. So, the, you, you right? So once, once you start also adding in the, the weight of that relationship and there may be multiple relationships not just advice giving but you know maybe i give you advice but you give me money back you know then that's a very different relationship than when i just give you advice you don't give me anything back so now we also suddenly have two relationships in that network um and then we can have three or four or five and they may all interact so you can see that it becomes very large very big uh, uh very quickly um, and for that, we need um, uh, we need specialized algorithms, specialized software. You, we can no longer use all the standard regression models that that, you, that you've learned in your in, in your career so far, uh, because all of your observations are now dependent of each other. Uh, so all of the uh, main assumptions that you make in terms of you know the, the standard statistical models that you use to no longer are valid. So um, this becomes a pretty huge uh, computational challenge. And that is something that the field uh, deals with and that you'll also figure out because even though we will keep our examples and our data sets pretty small, um, you know, it, it may still take you multiple cups of coffee until an analysis has run. Um, in my case, cups of tea, uh, it, it may take you a lot of time every time when you, so you, you really have to think about very clearly how to set up your analysis, what to put in, what not to put in, um until right so that that it's not going to take you uh, uh you know, multiple cups of uh, coffee or tea and then to realize that you know ah you should have put in a different thing um you know you can do that once or twice but before you know it, your afternoon is gone um and actually one of the things that you claudia will probably explain that later but one of the things that we'll do in our exam in the end is that you actually also part of half of the exam is actual analysis of network data so then if you don't think about it 
uh, very well, then you know you could actually waste a lot of your time uh, waiting for algorithms to run that you know are, are unnecessary. So computational challenges are really huge, and um, that, that's something to um, that, that you'll find and to, to be aware of. So we'll 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 make heavy use of um, of the R uh, programming environment because that has by far uh, the best and the most specialized algorithms and software. Um, so you don't you don't have to program it yourself, but still you have to tell the software what you want it to do. Um, and it's you know it's going to take you a while every now and then that you have to wait for it to run. Um, and in our case, if you if you do real life serious statistical models. Um, the models that I run, I frequently have to wait a couple of days uh, until the model is actually done. And then we figure out that we should have specified it slightly differently. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's data science. Okay, so um, I think by now you've probably realized that networks are, are, are pretty important and it's something that, you know, we cannot escape. Uh, so, you know, we live inside networks. We're also shaped by networks because, you know, we are inside networks. So also, you know, people influence, influence us, right? And uh, you get advice, you receive friendships or people may get angry with you and then, you know, then your whole day is ruined because someone shouted at you. Um, you know, that's, you are affected also your emotional state, but also, you know, whether you can get a job or not, whether you get a promotion or not. Or whether or not you get can get a particular advice or not, or start a new business or whatever, that's very much shaped also by the network that you're part of, um, and vice versa. Of course, we also have the power to shape our networks. So, and that's what we're constantly doing uh, in life. So, it's it's this is something that is it's not just um, um, an, an interesting topic uh, intellectually, but it's also something that you know you, you may start to realize that it's something that you're dealing with every day. Uh, in, in your life anyway. Um, any questions so far? I don't see anything pop up in the chat. Um, no questions? Okay, then let me give you a couple of examples uh, quickly because we are really running, out, running over time a little bit. Um, so this is a network that you're all painfully familiar with, right? This is the, uh, the COVID-19 virus, uh, which in itself is a network. Um, so why are we online today? Well, we are online because we have more than 75 students in our course. Um, and so if, if you look at this particular course, if you look at the, you know, the, whole, the whole corona situation uh, that we've been dealing with now for the last year and a half, um, at least here in the Netherlands, actively a year and a half, and, and I think worldwide about two years now, is um, that as you, as, you, as you may recall, there was this whole way, how, how do we deal with, you know, with Corona? How, how do we, you know, we don't want the whole society to be affected. Um, so let, let's just give you an example of, of how networks explain how a, a virus spreads. Um, so let's say you have, 200, 200 households and each household has an average of 15 contacts. Well, then you get a network essentially like this, uh, you know, just a big blob of relationships where everybody is connected to everybody just within a couple of steps. So this is what we call a network analysis. This is one giant component. Uh, everybody is connected to everybody and, and actually pretty quickly. So in this kind of network, if you introduce a virus anywhere, it, it can spread very quickly. So um, once we started to realize that in, um, in March of last year, um, actually the, the, the Dutch government said, well, you know, people have to stay at home. We're going to go in, in, into lockdown and uh, only people who have essential jobs uh, are still allowed to go to their work. Everybody else has to go home, right? So then we suddenly, then, even though, you know, we teach this, really cool course. Uh, apparently we're not an essential job. So we also had to you know, move everything over online. So um, what happens actually when you do that? Well, you know, when you, when, you, when you go online, so let's see that now we have the same 200 households and we assume that there are 
that 10% of these households are have you know, someone in that household has an essential job. So they go to the office and everybody else stays at home. And you know, this let's say we have a very strict lockdown where the only only people you communicate with are the people that you meet at work. Who, uh, um, and uh, in, in this case, this is an example where uh, some people randomly have some interactions and that's it. So now you have these blue, blue dots that have uh, the essential jobs. So that's about 10% of, uh, of the population. And I forget, I think they all have an average of four contacts or something that they meet because they have this essential job, like, you know, a doctor who meets with patients, right? Those patients are not, do not have the essential job, but they still interact with the doctor because, you know, they have to go to the, do the doctor because you're sick uh, or because they have a broken toe or whatever. Um, and, and, you know, then they, they, they get into, in, in, in contact with each other. Now, if these, these blue dots have on average, so not everybody's same, but on average have four relationships, uh, this is one, one way that that network would look like. So in this case, now there's actually a, a, a cluster of about a quarter of all the households. So all, a quarter of all the households are connected to each other some way. Um, so the result is that about three quarters of the network uh, of, of the households are not. So they would be shielded from coronavirus because they're not in, in touch with anyone else. But about a quarter of, of the households are at some point interacting with each other, um, either directly or indirectly. So the coronavirus could spread that way. So in this case, if you, if you only have 10% uh, essential households and they have on average four contacts with other people, then only about a quarter of your population might get coronavirus. Uh, and three quarters will not, right? Just assuming that this is the only only thing going on at the time. Um, now, then there was this discussion, said, well, you know, this gets boring quite quickly. So maybe people should actually be able to get at least someone over uh, as a friend every now and then, even though, you know, they may not have an essential job, but, you know, if people who have essential jobs never see anyone else, then you know, that's, that's not a life. So there was this whole discussion about okay, how many people are you allowed to interact with? So now here, what you look at is a network where every household now, besides the whole essential thing, uh, is now allowed to interact with just one individual. Right? That's, that's the rule. You can interact, everyone you can interact with just one individual. And then of course you have the essential uh, households who still have, you know, who still are able to interact the way they, they just did. Um, and now what you see with just the introduction of one individual. So here, for example, you see that you know, these two households communicate with each other, these two households communicate with each other. And they are essentially, as long as no none of these two gets corona, then they're completely safe. Um, but now what you see is that 71% in this example, 71% of nodes are, interact, are connected to each other one way or the other. So they're all forming one component. So you can move from one to the other you know, step by step. So now if only one of those uh, households gets Corona, actually the virus has a potential, not guaranteed, but it has a potential to spread to about 70% of the population. Just by introducing one individual uh, um, as a, a, you know, someone that you may interact with, whether you're essential, have an essential job or not. So you can see that how quickly that, that, that spreads. And if you want, um, and there's something that you can do uh, you know, later on, after, uh, tomorrow or whatever, whenever, if you, if you feel like it, there's actually an, a, an interactive application that if you click this, then actually this opens this website where I can actually start playing with it. I'll just very briefly show you that. Okay, let me reload. Um, it was inactive for quite a while, so it's okay. Um, this is an application, an online application that uh, reproduces these results. And then you can start playing with, well, you know, how, how many essential contacts, how many essential households are there? How many people are you allowed to contact with? So, so for example, you can, you can play with, okay, let's say that you have 200 households where 10% of them have the essential job uh, and let's say that when you have this essential job you communicate let's just turn that down we just have four let's say that on average you have three connections 
Um, but now you have two connections or two connections on average, everybody is allowed to have those two. Um, okay. See if my internet is fast enough to, okay, to render it while I'm using Zoom. So now what you see is just by, even though I, I, I decreased the number of essential connections that people have from four to three, uh, just by making, they're saying, well, you know, yeah, you can have two people come to your house, you know, not just one. Now we already had almost 90% of the population that is connected and that, you know, if, if COVID is introduced in one of them and actually it can spread across almost the entire population already. So here you can start playing with these numbers and um, this is all built on what are what is called uh, exponential random graph models. And that is a huge topic in, uh, in our second half of our course uh, where you will be able, where you will start you know, modeling, building these kinds of models yourself, uh, not with the, 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 the virus spread, but you know, these type of models yourself. Um, and you can play with that if you, if you want to um, outside of this lecture. So, oh, oh, by the way, all the slides that we're using, we, we all use, uh, we use HTML5 slides. So they will be uh, uh, posted online uh, as HTML. So you actually run them in your browser and you can, they're fully interactive. So you can, right, so all of this and you can, you can click here and it'll open the, 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 the open the, the, the uh, application and it, all of this is fully interactive. And so you can, uh, you know, uh, interact with these slides uh, at your own leisure. Uh, later on. Um, one really um, well-known uh, social network analysis study is of windsurfers on the beach. And this is the, the very first paper that came out of that. Actually, there are multiple papers. Uh, and, 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 and Lynn Freeman uh, is the guy who, uh, who was you know, the, the, the main person behind his research. And what they did is they spent a month uh, on the beach uh, observing uh, the interaction of windsurfers. And um, and they you know had, had this notebook notebook with them and they were writing down exactly who communicates with whom. Actually, also interviewed a bunch of them, um, and they they collected the network data. And what they were mainly interested in is to see whether people actually knew what the structure of you know the community was that they were part of, um, and that's what they call social intelligence. Um, but actually, one of the things they also realized was that they're actually several subgroups within that windsurfer community. Um, and they, they, so they, they collected the data and they, they, they studied it over um, uh, 31 days of, of, uh, of observations. Um, so you know, it's very painful to have to spend you know, a month on the beach pretending to do academic research, but you know, that's what they did. Um, and this is actually really interesting research, and we, we're going to come back to this data set a little later on. But this this is a visualization of what the, what this windsurfer network looked like uh, over those 31 days. And you can see there's a lot of changes in structure, a lot, a lot of variation going on in, in, in terms of the structure. So I mean, there are days when only a couple of people showed up, and then there are these right, and then there's these days where there were lots who are all interacting with each other like here, but then there were still six that didn't interact with any of the others, et cetera. So they, they, they collected that kind of data. And this was a famous study for two reasons. One reason is because um, this, this, this was, you know, this data set was made available and it was one of the very first times that people who actually came more from the, the like the anthropology, anthropology kind of perspective, uh, but very quantitative, um, started to bring this kind of data to the world and started to analyze them um, and also brought it very much to sociology. Another reason why this is a very famous study is because who doesn't want to spend 31 days on the beach doing research? Um, so I guess a lot of, you know, a lot of us are very envious at them for figuring out this kind of research and getting funded for doing this research. Um, and Lynn Freeman, who is the main researcher in this field, is also known for always coming to uh, social network conferences wearing uh, shirts with a Hawaiian print on it. So he was essentially full time on the beach uh, in his head. Um, so this, this, is, this, is, this is very, very well known, uh, known kind of research. 
uh, very much focusing now on the interaction of individuals. Um, so let me go a little faster. Let me, let me just show you a couple of networks. Um, who knows what this network is? If you can you know, unmute or type it in the chat, that's also fine. What if, and this is a very famous network. Um, anyone? Maybe you've already seen this picture at some point. Wasn't this one of the first uh, internet networks? Well, not just one of the first. This was the, net, the internet in 1970. Yeah, definitely. So there were two, two spots essentially where there were, were computers. There was on, on the, the two coasts. Um, and this was the entire internet <laughs> uh, 50, uh, 50 years ago, uh, 51 years almost ago, definitely, yeah. So here's an example of another network. This is, um, and you can see it's, it's a little bit more, uh, there's more going on. This is 436 employees at uh, Hewlett Packard. Um, and this is a well-known uh, well research where they looked at how do people interact with each other. And we may come back to this a little later on because even if you look at it right now, you may already see some structure, but as soon as you start using some quantitative measures, you can, you can very clearly see that there's some, some, some very, very, very clear structures going on that you see a lot in organizations. Um, again, this, so, but this is who, you know, people emailing to each other. And you would expect that, you know, if you, if you look at the literature on, on, on email, that, you know, you would expect much more equal communication if you just look at the technological literature on email. But if, as soon as you put in the social aspect, then you, can, then you actually, it makes a lot of sense that it's very skewed. Um, and we'll, we'll, we may get back, uh, come back to this later on. Uh, this is an interesting example and also very well known. Uh, um, this is a lot of Adamix research and she looked at uh, blogs on the internet. And this was prior to the 2004 presidential elections. And she looked at, well, what do people, what is the, 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 the political color of that particular blog? So is it, is it, is it, uh, 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 is it more left-wing or more right-wing, if you will? Uh, more, so Republicans or, or, or Democrat, and um, what other blog do they refer to, right? So if you have links between blogs, uh, do, they, do they refer to other blog, uh, blogs that are, have the same color or not? And as you can see, very much, this, uh, people talk mainly to each other, right? So um, the, 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 the Republican blogs, are mainly, are mainly referred to by other people who also have their Republican blogs. And the Democratic blogs are mainly written and referred to by other Democrats. Um, and there's actually surprisingly little uh, communication between them. And mind you, this is, this is almost 20, 20 years ago. I mean, right now we would say, well, the United States is politically very much segregated. But as you can see here, this was uh, 20 years ago and it was already very much like that, um, very clearly separated. Um, so our course is about social network analysis for data scientists. And let me very quickly summarize what that means. Uh, so we are going to focus mainly on human behavior. Right? So there's, there are lots of different kinds of networks, but especially the last kinds of networks that I showed you are networks that are created by humans. So we're going to look at many networks of humans or created by humans. Um, we're going to be focusing on practical analysis. So this is not a course where you're going to learn uh, you know, uh, uh, the mathematical description so much or the mathematical algorithms for, uh, for analyzing. No, we're actually going to be doing an analysis. And of course, you need to understand the tools. Um, and uh, you, you need to be able to you know, apply them uh, correctly and uh, substantively meaningfully. Um, but you know, that, is, that is the general idea. So you're, you're going to be learning how to analyze networks, uh, not just how to you know, design algorithms for them. Um, and we're going to do that mainly by focusing on statistical models. But again, because it's data science, it is based on meaningful, substantively meaningful questions that matter because we are, we are at JAMS. Um, that's what the, 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 the course will mainly be about. So if there are no further questions, I would say let's break. Um, for Claudia, how long uh, would you like to have a break until you... 10? 10? What do you think? 10, ten minutes? That sounds fine. So okay. a, quarter, a quarter after three, we reconvene and then uh, Claudia is going to take over. So um, see you in a bit.
let's say a few words about myself. So I do social network analysis. That's my main interest. And um, I also do other methods such as uh, statistical analysis and more uh, in general complexity uh, studies. And uh, we will spend a few words uh, about this uh, later as well. My main interest when it comes to research is uh, studying information or innovations as at the same one or the other, or basically there is a lot of overlap with information and some sort of innovation and how it spreads in networks of people, but also within uh, organizations. And uh, this connects very uh, strongly to communication science and to organizational uh, theory. And my main, main background is in political science. And more specifically, I have a PhD in computational politics. That means that I worked on computational methods uh, applied to political science problems. And uh, yeah, this is basically the uh, summary of uh, all these things that I did. Okay, enough about me. And uh, we can move on to the main focus of this class, which is, as you know already now, social network analysis. So how do we get here? With Roger, you got a lot of introduction, a lot of information about how, uh, what it is, how it works, and um, a lot of cool examples. Now let's get a little, little, little bit on the history of this, of this discipline, a little bit because if we wanted to actually discuss the history of this field, it will take us an entire, an, an entire class. And this is not the case. We are, we are going to learn network, social network analysis and not to cover the history, but at least it's nice to know where, it is, where this is coming from, at least a little. So we have two, store, two starts for one episode in progress. The story in progress is social network analysis and two starts. Uh, Roger already mentioned these two uh, subfields. One is graph theory and the other one is social network analysis. They started independently and at some point they strongly merged into this uh, discipline that we now uh, study and we actually enjoy very much. And so graph theory, so this is a graph which is exactly has a network, but if you are a mathematician, you want to call it graph. Uh, as much as if you are a computer scientist, you probably had some exams in, in graph theory because it's strongly, uh, it's very important for computer scientists as well. And uh, if you are a physicist, you probably use them as well. Uh, however, it depends in which context you learn them. You might call it network, so you might call it graph. But graph theory is the study of how entities that we call node or vertex are connected uh, through edges or links, or it depends on your discipline, you will call it differently. How this discipline started with this yellow guy over here that wasn't very pretty, but he was very smart. So Euler is considered the father of topology. Uh, what has topology to do uh, with graph theory? Well, this guy got obsessed with this bridge. This bridge, this series of bridge, bridges, uh, where in Konigsberg, which was in Germany back then, we are in the 17th, in the 18th century, and uh, now is in Russia, in Kaliningrad, I think. Anyway, this Euler wanted to find a way to cross the bridges only once and go around in a pathway. Uh, if you want, I could give you one hour, two hours to solve this problem. Well, you won't solve it. Euler didn't. Nobody did it. Apparently, unless somebody proves us wrong, this is absolutely impossible. But Euler got kind of obsessed with this problem and he ended up formalizing it. So each bridge is considered as a node and each of the connections between this node, each pathway is considered an edge. And this is what is considered the start of graph theory. So sometimes obsessing over something that looks kind of irrelevant is actually very helpful. Uh, don't stop doing it in case you are actually doing it over something. You might become the next Euler. Okay, but after this start, uh, 300 years ago, more than that even, um, Graph theory developed as a discipline detached from topology, mainly in the middle of the last century with these two uh, scholars, Polar Doss and Alfred Brainy, that actually started it off as a subfield of mathematics. 
and individually they are also known for the random networks so if i give you i don't know 10 nodes there are 10 uh, minus one uh, combinations that you can have between those nodes that's this is a random network what you can generate in there is a random network and here this number is something quite funny that is an important concept in network analysis so these are those this is the guy on the left hand side was a particular person and uh, he didn't have a proper home but he used to have a lot of friends and live and he used to live with a lot of them for one month or two months or something uh, since he was an academic this was a very productive strategy because he had a lot of collaborators and they published a lot of papers together and basically you can count uh, the distance that you have from a dot what distance means so if I publish with Erdos and I haven't, uh, I will be distance one from Erdos. Uh, if uh, Roger did publish with Erdos and he hasn't either, uh, I will be distance two. So the chain keeps moving and you get your Erdos number. And this is uh, something that is very important for uh, measuring the paths inside the network. We will talk about that in the following weeks. Um, the concept started with their DOS, but now if you want to try it out, there is the Kevin Bacon game online, which is uh, quite funny to reflect on these sort of ideas or network ideas. So, you know, Kevin Bacon is an actor that was very famous in the 80s, but you might know it anyway, that apparently worked with lots of people. So basically, if you just go to this website that calculates um, the number for you, you can find, you can put a random name of an actor in there and you can find the distance from Kevin Bacon. So uh, they use this network concept to make something quite funny and enjoyable uh, to see. But at the same time, you understand uh, the small world effect. So that actually is not that unlikely that you are connected in a few steps to people that you have no idea who they are, but that's how, um, research proved this phenomenon to work. Uh, okay, no, it's just about the camera. I was reading the chat. Okay, let's move on here. So um, this uh, graph theory uh, concept got several applications. This is just to give you an example. Uh, one of the main application that has in physics is explaining coffee. This sounds quite funny maybe, but if you want to make coffee, you can model this as a square lattice. So this, imagine that all these dots, all these nodes are uh, coffee particles. And uh, when the coffee is, uh, is not done, so when it's just powder, these are all disconnected. But as, as soon as you put the hot water on top, they change their status and they connect. They create what is called a giant component because they become all intertwined or, or connected and you get coffee. So that's one physical application of graph theory that has been studied extensively. Um, Oracle of Bacon, thank you very much. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. It works for other celebs. Fantastic. Play around with that. It's really instructive, nerdy, instructive, funny. Okay. What else? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay. The other side, the other stream that was born independently is social network, which is born within sociology mostly, not only, but mostly. Anyway, within social sciences. As, as we said already, a social network is not only Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, or name your favorite social network. Um, that will be an example, because they are all social networks, but it's any relationship between uh, people or, um, uh, that you can actually uh, study for a so if it's interesting to study that will be considered a social network and that will be measured so you can try to collect data about anything that you find interesting and measure it as a social network online offline doesn't matter so very often when you discuss social networks people think that is just about the online world but this is absolutely um, reductive. The concept is much broader than that. And you will find out that basically anything can be seen as a relationship because after you take this class, you will be a little bit biased toward finding relationships between things, but not everything is interesting as 
a network. It can be modeled, but not necessarily is a good idea. So we will also discuss when it is a good idea to think of something as a network and when it's not. Okay, so when we talk about social sciences and that we want to measure, so measuring a social phenomenon, we need to name this guy, which is Auguste Comte. Uh, he was um, a, a sociologist and he started to think um, that social phenomenon can be measured as much as physical phenomenon. It's just as it's harder somehow to conceptualize a social phenomenon, but once you have a definition of what you want to measure, you can actually find a way to measure it, and then you can move on uh, as much as you do with any other science. Uh, and uh, then we have this other scholar, Emile Durkheim, that basically compared the societies to biological system. So probably if now I tell you that you can compare how people live in a society and how bees live in a beehive, it doesn't sound that new to you because probably you heard some that did this before. But this guy was one of the first that thought that actually uh, relationships uh, between humans are actually comparable to biological systems that are apparently automatically organized. So we know that bees behave in a certain way because they have a certain instinct that tells them how to behave. Well, humans are not exactly doing that, but they are highly comparable. So natural world can be compared to social world extensively. And uh, the step between modeling this uh, and just having the idea is really, really small. And then we have, following this line, um, one of the very, very, very first studies that use network concepts. So this person, Moreno, over here, not very pretty either, but pretty brilliant, um, was a psychiatrist. So he couldn't care less about networks, to be honest. He just wanted to solve a practical problem. So somebody called him because in this school in the US, Hudson School, there were girls in there that were running away. They didn't want to stay in school. So in the first place, they checked their mental health status, but apparently they were okay, or there was nothing that seems to be wrong on that perspective. So Moreno ran several analysis. I mean, analysis means that talk to them and uh, discuss the problem extensively and found out that the reason why these girls were quitting the school was not related to humidity or uh, poor heating system or the quality of the food that probably was really low anyway. It was related to the fact that they didn't enjoy to be in the social group in the school. So potentially there was one person that was bullying them. And uh, if they were, for instance, rooming next to this person, next to this girl that was a bully, they didn't want to be there anymore because they were really suffering the situation. And uh, mapping this down in a network managed, I mean, doing that, Moreno managed to find out what was the problem and to prevent this from happening again and to prevent this Hudson School from shutting the doors and, uh, I mean, go bankrupt because that's the case in the US, you know, that public education is not really a thing. So this is one of the first study and the, um, the diagram that Moreno used to map this down is called sociogram. So a network in sociology can also be called sociogram and you call it also sociometry. It's a way to measure relationship in a very, very, very qualitative way to get back to Brown's question uh, before. Okay, and then we have this other guy. This guy was a psychologist, but he was a bit more interested specifically into networks than Moreno. And uh, uh, basically uh, he just wanted to see how people reacted in a network. So you are a person. And if I put you in a certain network, you play a certain role. So you are, just, you are not a dot in a, in, a, in a picture, right? You're a person. And if I want to organize something and you are inside my organization, I want to know how you feel, right? So he set it up an experiment uh, in MIT. And uh, so basically these are people. So people, pe person, 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 person. And they tried to communicate in these shapes. So they were sitting down uh, with chairs and everything in those shapes. And basically, we found out very different patterns of behavior. So these people involved in the experiment experienced very different things if they were in one or the other shape. So essentially, this shape, the X one, is the most efficient. So if there is a person at the center and you pass notes, paper notes to this person, the communication will be very efficient. And for instance, if this person is 
I don't know, um, the speaker person for the group, it will be able in less than five minutes to collect all the information and to say, okay, my group thinks this. However, this will be very, very, very frustrating for the people on the sides because they won't, they won't be involved in the activity. They have just to pass one piece of paper. The most enjoyable shape for them was this one because they were all full involved. But in terms of efficiency, it was much less okay for the goal. So um, from a psychological perspective, this was really interesting. So the idea is that if you have a group of friends, this will be ideal. But if you are in a working environment and you need to get something done, it will be much better. And these two other shapes are in between. And uh, then we have another relevant study uh, that is a milestone in the history of uh, social network and is the Zachary Karates Club. So this is another study made in a university and uh, there is a karate club. Yeah, you probably guessed that already. And um, Zachary started to understand that there were two groups inside the karate club. They were really not um, bonding with each other. So there were a few people over here. They were connected. So the, the two groups are not fully disconnected. There were a few connections, but the, the, the great bulk of the activities were completely separated, one here and one there. And this might seem very, very simple as a, as a consideration, but this is actually the beginning of a field called community detection that basically is now huge. And there are hundreds of people that work in developing algorithm that are focused on how to detect what is a group, how you split a group from the other. So this is a whole computational field that you might actually find really, really cool at some point. Okay, so what's the connection between these two uh, groups? So we have the graph theory side and we have the social network side. What put them together, like crucially together, is the computational revolution. So since, you, since we started to have computers, it was possible to enlarge uh, the studies that you do in sociology. Because in sociology, you collect tons of data. In social sciences, data is really large. So just imagine the data generated online. This is all social science data, not all of it, but the great bulk is social sciences oriented data. Without a computer, you don't know what to do with that. You cannot possibly handle it. So now that we have computer and we have big data because we know how to collect them, now is the time for social network analysis and for computational studies. And that's how the two disciplines merge into one and uh, that's why we are here with you all together to learn how to deal with all this data and all these cool computers and try to do something fun and cool with them. So uh, as Roger already mentioned, the, the great challenge now is to, it's to explain complexity. Complexity is a whole field of study, and again, you might know it already, So, but just for those of you who don't know what exactly it means. So if you have variable A and variable B, and there is an effect of A over B, this is a linear effect, and this is simple. This is called simple effect. If you have several variables that influence a variable A in many different ways, this is a this is a complicated effect, in simple words, that will be linear still, nonlinear, but this is something that we can predict. It might be difficult to predict it, but still we have models, powerful models, that can predict what happens to this variable A that we actually are observing. However, there is a third situation here in where basically it's so complex, there are so many variables and there are so many effects and so many things going on that basically our outcome, so what we know about the variable that we are trying to monitor, that we call variable A, it's absolutely impossible to understand. And in complexity science, we call this emergence. So when there is an emergent effect that we cannot absolutely explain with the data that we have, that's a complexity scenario. And this is not possible to tackle, it's not possible to tackle this complexity with the regular methods that have been used, uh, used 50 years ago. They can get to up to a certain point. That's why we are developing new methods or refining old methods to be able to explain more, to be able to, to address these problems that are uh, where not possible to address even 40, 30 years ago. There is a range of methods that allows you to do that. So um, for instance, we have agent-based models and we have systems 
and dynamics models. And these are mostly, um, so these things are very interdisciplinary. But if I say it's different dynamics models, this is mostly engineering. If I say agent-based models, probably is more in the epidemiology side or also somehow uh, computer scientists. Uh, if I say causal loop diagrams, which is another method, it's really in between several disciplines. Anyway, one of these methods is social network analysis. And it's pretty huge because you can actually combine them. Because for instance, if you want to use agent-based models or causal loop diagrams, you can mix them with social network analysis and you get to have very, very, very powerful tools to explain context. And this is extremely cool because it's new, it's cutting edge and it's exciting. So let's take a look. Um, in, 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 in a nutshell, what is the difference between uh, computational approaches in physics and in social science? Because people think that there is a huge distance between uh, physics, mathematics and, and biology and social sciences. When you use computational approaches, the only real difference between these two things is the topic. So am I studying people? Okay, this is called social science. Am I studying birds? Okay, this is biology. Am I studying, um, name it, uh, I don't know, stones that interact because you throw them, that's physics. So seriously, at this point um, in our age, the difference is really teeny tiny. It's just about the topic. And we still used to talk about natural world versus social world. There are lots of comparison. Okay, the topic is different, fair enough. But uh, if you observe the way people interact and the way a market um, works or um, birds, there are a lot of commonalities. And the study of these commonalities is part of what complexity science does. And network analysis is one of the tools that you use to explain that. Just to give you one example of how you intertwine these methods. So you already saw um, one of the graphs that Roger showed you before, that was a causal loop diagram. So this is another causal loop diagram, this one. And this is the network. We are here uh, in this study that I'm showing you, we are trying to explain why people are obese and try to find a solution for the problem. So you might know that obesity is a huge problem all over the world. Uh, this study was financed in Australia. And uh, with a network analysis here, we track down all the people involved in solving the problem. So here we have the local government, uh, here we have the health services that provide help for these people, but we also have education because, for instance, if you go to school and in school they only learn French fries every single day, there is a very hard that they will get obese and um, things like that um, are mapped down in this network. So all the stakeholders. Over here you have the stakeholders and the relationship that, in, that are um, generating the process of obesity. So these are comparable but complementary. So each of these two is mapping down a different angle of the problem. So you can model them at the same time. If you, if you connect, so for instance, here is the school and here is the school too. Uh, in this level here, we can see how it's connected to another stakeholder. In this level here, we can see how uh, what they do is generating a, a, a consequence. So what, what happens when they serve french fries every day uh, to another uh, level of the analysis. If you study them together using network analysis as, a, as one single network that is multi-level and you see the connection between these two, your um, analytical power skyrockets if you compare it to one level only. So all these things are completely customizable and uh, allow you to explain very, very, very cool things. Okay, so with this model mix and match, um, um, you can do a lot of things, as I said. Let's have a look at some more examples. So, for instance, this is something that you might not fa be familiar with. It's called ego network. It's still another thing that you will see in network analysis. We are not going to spend a lot of time doing that because this is more of a qualitative approach than still on wrong question. And um, so, yeah, this bluish purplish dot is a person. 
and is a person that had a heart, some sort of heart disease. And we want to know how much time it takes for this person to get out of the hospital. But obviously we are not interested in one person only. We are interested in reducing the time that people stay in an hospital when they have heart disease and they get surgery for that. And uh, this is uh, needed because you know that it costs money uh, when, you, when you stay at the hospital. And so we would like to spend less money on that. So what do we do? We monitor their social network and uh, we know that if the person is uh, our target person, uh, the closest people, the closest people to this person that we are interested in are the son, understandably, the general practitioner, so the home doctor, they are the closest. A little bit less close is the pharmacist. So probably this specific person has a personal relationship with the pharmacist. Let's say that he sees the son and the GP every single day. He might see the pharmacist twice per week. Then on the distance three, we have nothing. And then you can't read it very well, but this is the sister. So on distance four, we have this sister. So this study ended up showing that the people that had closest people here, so more people in the row one, here, uh, were dismissed from hospital in a fastest way. So basically, in order to make them um, recover faster, they needed to have a support. So that was funding, the main funding of it. So if they had their son or um, some sort of organization that will help them, they will recover faster, both from a psychological level uh, and for the simple fact that they needed help in a practical way. And it was done on in their network, they couldn't find that out in any other way. So that was an interesting finding of this study. And if I show you just this picture and I talk about one person, this will be called qualitative study because I can use this image to represent what one person does. However, if I start to have 500 people and I want uh, to do this picture 500 people and it's kind of difficult to explain this story and make it interesting. So uh, there, there are very few people that will actually like to go through 500 pages, checking all these diagrams one by one. And that's when you do a quantitative study, when you want to find metrics that summarize something and makes it, make it more understandable and, um, and suitable for an audience. So um, sometimes the difference between qualitative and quantitative is not that far. The conceptualization is the same. It's just that when you go qualitative, you, you focus on people. When you go quantitative, you can actually find uh, information that are relevant on a population that are statistically interesting on the, on the whole population. And uh, this is another example of modeling that you can do. I'm giving you just an overview here. So um, this study wanted to understand a, a debate that happened in, um, in the parliament in the UK. So they wanted to have a minimum price for alcohol. So let's say that you have a bottle of wine, it costs 10, they wanted to increase it to minimum 15. This is just a random example, I don't know the numbers. Okay, um, they discussed it in the parliament and there were a lot of people discussing this and the um, newspapers reported uh, the view uh, of all the stakeholders involved in the debate. So here in these uh, different colors, you can see the category of stakeholders. So for instance, here you have a think tank, you can have several, or you have charity organization, and also you can have many, and uh, so on and so forth. And basically all the statements that were found on the newspapers were coded um, by topic. And if several of these stakeholders agreed on something, they were considered um, in relationship to each other because they agreed on, on something. And this is the final uh, picture that you find out of it. So these stakeholders here belonging to those groups uh, with those col colors were the proponents. So the people that wanted this to happen. And these other over here were the opponents. And this is a very efficient way to summarize what was going on. And that's called network analysis. And there are not, I mean, there are other ways to do it, but this is a pretty efficient one to deliver this information to a larger audience. Okay, 
Another example, so this is a survey that has been done in the US, about 5,000 people replied in 2008, right before Obama was elected. This uh, row over here is the Democratic Party, and this row over here is the Republican Party. People were asked, how much do you like the Democratics from 0 to 10? How much do you like the Republican from 0 to 10? So this is 0, this is 10. Obama won. So this is 10, and we see the ticker line. The ticker line represents the, the, the higher number of people. However, so when you express um, two opinions, one for the Democrats and one for the Republicans, these two opinions are related to each other. And why are they related? Because I'm expressing them. So I have an opinion about the Democrats, an opinion about uh, the Republican, and these two opinions are necessarily connected because if I love Obama and I give the, the Democratic Party at 10, it's very likely that I, will, that I will give the Republican Party at zero. And we see that in this line over here. And we also see that there were several undecided people that gave a five to one and a five to the other. And we also see that some of others voted for Obama, but they don't hate the Republican. They are five years and 10 years. So probably those were originally Republican voters that loved Obama so much that they switched just for the occasion. But maybe in another election, they will go back inverting their preference. And this is also a network that shows you that. And this is modeling, what we call modeling with networks. Okay, so enough about examples. You got the idea at this point. Where to find us? Um, well, you find Roger and I in class, so that's not that difficult. But if you want to find a net, the social network community, there is an international organization that is called INSNA. And uh, this organization organizes several events. Uh, mainly, the most interesting are those two for us. So the Sunbelt is the flagship, flagship conference. It's difficult to say flagship conference and it's all over the world. So each year is in a different continent. So next year it will be in Australia, this year was in the US. The last time uh, in Europe was Utrecht 2018. So it's been in the Netherlands already and it will get back to the Netherlands in a, well, in a long time probably. And uh, when this conference is not in Europe, we have the European version of it. So every year there is a gathering uh, of social network analysts in Europe. Uh, normally, uh, during coronavirus, not really. Uh, we have an online gathering rather than an actual one, as you can imagine. But still, the idea is the same. But anyway, if you want to find information about where network analysis hide, that's where they hide. And uh, there is more, obviously. So uh, not every person obsessed with networks is obsessed with society. Some people hate people. So uh, they are entitled to, to do so. And they can study any other kind of network that they enjoy studying. And they go to other conferences. And uh, there is a lot of overlap. So NetSci, uh, it's more of a method conference. So if you want to develop a new network app, network algorithm or something, you might present it to NetSci. Otherwise, if you want to use network analysis to explain a complex phenomenon, you go to ComplanNet or to complex networks. The difference is mostly that this one is in Europe and this one is all over the world. So one year you might find that going to China is not really easy for you and you just switch to this one that is usually in Spain and it's kind of a good holiday as well. Um, so that's the difference. You can present social network analysis here as much as in the other one. It's just that here there will be a larger variety of uh, presentations, uh, not in number, in topic. And the uh, last one that I want to uh, show you is computational social science. So uh, when you do computational social science, you run models in a computer, you run numbers, you crunch numbers. And in this master, you're going to crunch a lot of numbers, not just in this class, you're, but in many others, you're going to do a lot of other computational things. This is the place where you can present all these computational works. And this is a pretty nice conference as well. And uh, it's usually in Europe, it depends. Okay, so do you see yourself presenting to one of these conferences in the, in the future? It's a nice experience if you want. My opinion, you might not be interested in this. Think about it, why not? Um, so um, just also think about the fact that you have to develop a project in this class and it might be good enough to get there, who knows? 
just uh, depends how much uh, time you spend on it and how much enthusiastic you are on that. And uh, so, okay, enough about networks, enough about um, this. So this, is, this was the introduction. Let's get to the nitty gritty of this class. What happens here? So each week you need to read the, a book chapter. Normally it's one book chapter or two small things. It's not a lot of readings, it's really not. But as Roger said already, please do it because otherwise you will fall behind. And also if you do it, you're ready for the exam. So it's very convenient for you to do it. Then we have the tutorial. So every week, Almost every week you have a tutorial to do in our package, the package that Roger and I are developing, that is called SNA for the S. Surprise, surprise. And then we have the on play, which is something that you need to solve. Like normally is a little problem or something that you need to solve that takes the topics of the tutorial and gives you the opportunity to use them immediately so you don't forget them. And um, again, if you keep up uh, each week, your life will be much easier. And uh, okay, assessment strategy. So oh, you already know very well that you work in groups. And um, your group project is 40% of your mark. Um, so it's, it's a consistent part of your mark. Then you have an individual assignment in which basically we want to know what, did, what you did in your group, which, which was your role in your, uh, in your group. And we will tell you about that later, but this is a small assignment. The other thing is the exam. Okay, let's get a little bit into all of this. So for the project, within your group, you have a very nice conversation and you decide what you like. Just pick something that you like, guys, because if you hate it, you will hate to work on it. So try to find something that inspires you. So it could be political science, organization, internet studies, social influence, marketing, sport, text analysis, recommended system, crime and safety, or anything else you want. But if it's something else, please talk to us because we can tell you whether it's possible to do a project on that in a few uh, months or whether it's more like a lifetime work. So if you have other ideas, just have a chat with one of us. So after you pick a topic that you like, you um, should identify something. I mean, small, so crime and safety, for instance, is a huge topic. Pick something inside of it that is specific and try to understand what you would like to know about that. And when you did and you formulate it to research questions, find data. So you have three options or you find data that has been collected already, or you find um, at least to collect the data and you collect it yourself, or you can do a little bit of both. So you can take some data that is, that is already out there and integrate it with some new data. So you can play around with that, but make sure that you identify and collect appropriate data. And uh, when you are there, you basically see uh, what can you do with this data and you formulate two research questions. I mean, you already formulated the research question, you formulate two hypotheses. And then you will use two of the models that we teach you in this class to um, answer this research question and to test this hypothesis. And when you are done with that, you will write a report all together in the group that is about 4,500 words. And you will use a template that we will provide you that is written in this R package that is called Papaya. And this is super easy. Don't worry about that. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, no question, I'll move on. So the individual assignment, as I said, you will explain how you contributed to the projects and what you learned overall, but we will go into details about that later and don't worry about it. And uh, the exam. So. You know what's an exam, right? So I'm not going to explain to you what's an exam. Uh, I can tell you that this exam is more or less divided into parts. One part is questions about the theory that you learn. So what you read in the book, make sure you read the book. The second part, you have one or more problem sets 
that you have to solve in class. So you will have to load the data and to figure out what are we asking you to do and run the analysis for us. And uh, we will uh, run, so we will receive your script with the code and we will rerun it of, of ourselves. And that's how the exam will work. Again, if you do the tutorials and you do the home play and you read the book, you will be fully prepared for that. Any question here?